explains that there are four, three actually principles that one should apply in the process of hearing. And that is the first principle is to have faith in the person who is speaking the knowledge as being qualified to give the knowledge. That is the first principle. Otherwise, why would you hear from such a person? <laughs> the second is humility or being uh, transparent, allowing that knowledge to, to go into one's consciousness without trying to block it with all kinds of intellectual, uh, what we say, uh, philosophical, uh, theoretical ideas that, well, trying to analyze it. You can analyze it to a point, but it has to be received at the same time. Because if it's not received, just like the whole idea of knowledge transmission comes from guru to disciple. The word Upanishad means sitting down near, sitting down near what? The spiritual master, the guru, who gives that knowledge. And when he's hearing submissively. The third, and this is the one that becomes more, what we say, uh, a concern for us is that destroying the faults of the mind. Destroying the faults of the mind means to, when the mind wanders away from the sound vibration, one has to carefully and very, uh, enthu not enthusiastically, but carefully bring it back to the sound vibration. Because the mind will wander, chanchala himena krishna pramati balabhadrita. The mind is always moving this way and that way, goes this way and that way. It can't stay still for one, it can stay still for three seconds, that's about it. <laughs> After that it's going out somewhere else for three seconds. <laughs> so it's very, it's, it's very, it's called chanchala, very flickering, moving this way and that way. So one has to, fix themselves. This is also very instructive when we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. We have to very carefully hear that sound and keep that mind focused on the sound vibration, just to hear nicely. Um, and the last is that if by destroying the faults of the mind, hearing nicely and uh, having that proper mood of receptivity and faith in the speaker, the last part is the consequence. And there are two con possible consequences. One, one gets realization on what is being spoken. One starts to understand it, not beyond the theoretical stage, but into the realized stage. Oh yes, this is, this is, uh, and I, I understand it, it makes sense. It has some meaning. I can also see how it applies to me. Some realization. And the other part is questions. So if one doesn't get questions or realization, that means one was not paying attention, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so these two things are there, have to be there. So uh, this is the process of hearing submissively. And so here, Uddhava was saying something a little different. If you think we are qualified to hear such knowledge, you know, this knowledge is not spoken to those who are, you know, simply interested in improving their material life. Such persons are unqualified to hear. Sometimes we see people take to Krishna consciousness in order to get more of a technique on how to manipulate the material energy. Because if you study these scriptures, you can understand how the material energy works. And you can also, if you study it from a point of view of understanding how to control it, you can't control it, but you can manipulate it a little bit to a point where you can try to adjust your situation to get a better result in your life. And so the people do approach the, 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 the spiritual uh, mood in order to increase their material life. But that's not the goal. The goal is actually to, to purify the heart, to actually become fully aware of who I am and what is my relationships. Now the process of hearing is the foundation for that. And out of all the nine processes, 
Hearing is the basis of all of the other eight. Vila Prabhupada makes this point. We have to hear regularly. We have to hear about chanting. We have to hear about serving. We have to hear about the, everything about Krishna consciousness, the receptivity and the understanding that comes from the receptivity is all based on the, the quality of the, the process of hearing. So that's, that's foundational in order to learn more. And Uddhava not only wants to hear, but he wants to hear that knowledge that will bring himself to self-realization. In the material world, people like to hear about everything, right? There's always more topics to hear about. People are bored with the present topic, so they always try to come up with something new, something different, something, you know, that it's practically the same thing, but if it's said in a different way or presented in a different way, it seems to be new. As they say, there's nothing new under the sun, but the way you present it appears to be new. Just like in religious life, in order to attract people to, to spiritual life, you have to take the same philosophy, the same practice, and present it in a way that appears to be unique. Because people get tired of hearing the same thing, it becomes mechanical, we get routine, like that. So the mechanical mentality starts to develop. If one starts to formulize things in, in a very, uh, what we say, rote way or a mechanical way, well, if I do this, I get this result, and if I don't do this, I don't get this result, and if I don't, if I don't do this, uh, then I'll get a different kind of, in other words, it becomes very mechanical. So sometimes they say you have to present the same wine in new bottles, old wine in new bottles. Now sometimes we present Krishna consciousness to different audiences in different ways just to attract them according to how they can understand the same thing. But there's nothing different. The philosophy is the same and the goal of the philosophy is the same is to get people attracted to Krishna. That's the whole goal but it might be presented in different ways. So this is, everything has to, centers around keeping the, the, the principle, the transcendental knowledge is there. So Uddhava was asking for something that happened millions, billions of years ago when the Lord spoke at the beginning of creation. And so he knows that that knowledge is never going to get old. It's always fresh. <laughs> it's like when we read these books, Prabhupada said that each time you read it, you get some realization from the reading. It's not like, well, yeah, I read the books. I know the books. Yeah, you don't have to tell me what's in it. But that's material consciousness because material subject matters get exhausted at a certain level. You can take a material subject matter and you can reach the end of the of all the explanations you can give it. But in spiritual topics, you can't. It goes deeper and it becomes more dynamic. It's called dynamic instead of static. Static means limited, dynamic means unlimited or always revealing more and more of the same. Srila Prabhupada was talking to, uh, to uh, Shruti Kirti, they were together. Prabhupada wanted to make a point, so he spoke to Shruti Kirti, and he said, if you read one page of nectar devotion, you can become fully self-realized. And then he retracted that and said, no, not one page, one paragraph. Then he said, no, not one paragraph, one sentence. No, not one sentence, if you just simply read one word. So is he just making some nice eulogy that sounds really cute? No, he's actually saying that this knowledge is dynamic. It's coming from the spiritual mouth. Taini Brahma Hidai Adi Kamaye. Brahma heard from Krishna this knowledge is spoken by the Supreme Word. So each of the, every the, each of the words have, a, have many, many meanings in relationship to the hearer and to the situation it's being directed towards. So that's why one famous uh, transcendentalist in the Western world, I think it was, it was, it was that Walt Whitman said, 
Uh, I read the Bible day and night. You read black and I read white. <laughs> In other words, two people can read the same scriptures and get something different from it. Like that because people perceive things in a different way. Therefore, you have to read and understand everything by the direction of the spiritual master who explains everything in detail. Srila Prabhupada tried to do that in his purports. When Srila Prabhupada was making his Bhakti Vedanta purports, he would think in terms of how the Western mind works and how that mind will be receptive to this transcendental knowledge. But Prabhupada was always thinking in terms of the audience that he was trying to give this knowledge, which he knew at that time was mostly people from Western countries who were not so familiar with the Vedic text. And so Prabhupada would, but still, even when you read his purports, although he really gets into details and to explain things, you still need to ask questions even on the details because this knowledge is so, so, at the same time, it's transcendental, but at the same time, it's very practical. So we have to understand the transcendence in a practical way so we can apply it in our day-to-day -day life. So transcendental knowledge is Shruti. Another name for the Vedas is called Shruti. Shruti means to hear. So Vedas are spoken knowledge, they're not simply written. What, what became written was necessary because after the age of Kali came in full force, people could not remember things. Uh, people's minds and intelligence and ability to remember in previous ages was much sharper. Now it's very hard to remember things. Sometimes you even forget your own name. Huh? Has that ever happened? Happened to me once, <laughs> twice. Who am I? Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Somebody asked me my name and I told them the wrong name. <laughs> you know, so we get really spaced out sometimes. Kali Yuga is the age of forgetfulness. Now there's a disease going around called Alzheimer's. People can't even remember who they are, what they are, where they are, or why they are, how they are. So this is, uh, this is the age of Kali. Everything becomes so deficient and so degraded and so debilitated. But if we hear constantly from the right source, then that knowledge develops in such a way that we can understand and apply it nicely. Well, the process is, it's constant here, Srinruta Swataka, Srinvata Svatkata Krishna Purnya Shravana Kirtanaha Ridanto Yavadrani Vidvihnoti Hushrit Sata. Krishna speaks this verse. He's, uh, I mean, Sutta Goswami is explaining what Krishna is saying. And he's explaining that the Lord in the heart purifies the person who is eager to hear one who is eager to hear. Uh, there's, a story, there's that wonderful story, it's in the, what is it, Bhagavatam Rita, where there was one, I can't remember all the details, but one great personality who was speaking Srimad Bhagavatam. And there was another personality, the whole story behind it, he became a ghost. And he somehow, to, in order to get out of his ghost body, he was instructed that he had to hear Srimad Bhagavatam constantly in order to get out of that ghost existence. He had committed a, a great offense and was, for, and was forced to take a ghostly body. The person who was speaking was a, a highly qualified. So the, there was an engagement called Bhav Bhagavat Saptaha, where seven days people would sit and listen to Srimad Bhagavatam and spoken continuously throughout the day. So he, he decided to join that in his ghostly feature. No one could see him, but he was there listening. And he was listening, listening, listening. And at the end of the day, when the narration was over, he constantly meditated on what he had heard throughout the evening. And he didn't break his meditation. And then the next day, when, the, when it was spoken again, he again picked it up. And in this way, for seven days, he never broke his concentration on the knowledge that was given. 
And at the end, he became not only free from the ghostly body, but he actually attained liberation and went back to the spiritual world. Whereas those people who came to hear, they didn't get the same benefit. Although they were in their physical forms, they were listening also. But this, this ghost, he was so de desperate in order to get out of his, uh, what we say, difficult situation, he constantly, 24 hours a day, he heard the process of hearing. And that gives a little in indication of the intensity that hearing has, should reach in order to reach the level of what we say realization. Because when you listen carefully, you get realizations. You will get understandings. Even if the speaker is always a little less qualified, if he's speaking something that is uh, authoritative, scriptural, coming from the disciplic succession, that knowledge will be purified. That knowledge will be purified. There was a story in Orissa, uh, I don't know how many years ago, where again, Bhagavad Saptaha. So people were coming. And one year, one bull, big bull, walked into the assembly of the people and sat down. Now, they, people came around and they tried to pull the bull out, but they couldn't move him. So they just let him stay there. So this bull, he was sitting through the whole narration, didn't say anything, didn't make any noise. And at the end of the narration, when it was over, he got up and left. And then the next day he returned, just at the right time. And then for seven days he came and went. And then at the end of the Bhagavad Saptaha, nobody saw him until the next year when that same pro uh, program was there. He came again and sat down. And then he was doing this year after year. And I don't know, he might even be doing it now, but it happened about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago in Orissa. So it's kind of a recent pastime. So you can see, <laughs> Even animals, they have that receptivity. There must have Bulma obviously was a, a sadhu in his previous life and somehow wound up in that body. And there was also the devotees would tell in, in Vrindavan, there was one monkey. He would come to uh, the, the discourse in Srimad Bhagavatam every Thursday. <laughs> he would always come on Thursday. <laughs> And he would climb up on the wall and listen to the Bhagavatam. I think it was outside in a courtyard. And then the same monkey, he would listen and then he would go and come back again the next Thursday. <laughs> of course, Prabhupada said many of the monkeys and dogs and Vrindavan and the pigs, they had committed offenses in being in Vrindavan in, in previous lives, so they were forced to take that lower body. And, uh, but we see that this, is, this process of hearing even attracts a certain persons, uh, certain souls who are in lower bodies like that. So how powerful this hearing is. And then what is this, um, that one verse? Saru Sangha, Saru Sangha, Sarva Sastri Hoi, Lava Matta Saru Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi. That one moment's association, in the association of a pure devotee in hearing the message of transcendence, the message of the glories of the Supreme Personality of God, and one can attain perfection. And the word is lava matta. Lava matta means one eleventh of a second. If you could divide a second into eleven parts, you get a matta, a, a lava matta. So the devotees in ISKCON, knowing this verse, and Prabhupada used to quote it, you know, occasionally, they asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, you're a pure devotee and we're sitting here, we're regularly hearing from you and there's a lot of love of mattas in our, you know, categories here, but we're not getting purified. So what is it? <laughs> we're not purified, we're not fully purified. What does this verse mean? Is it just some exaggeration? And Prabhupada gave the understanding, he said that, he said when the wood is wet, it doesn't ignite. 
if you try to you know, light wet wood, you, know, you have to dry it out first before it'll start to ignite into a fire. So in the same way, he said, continue to hear, and then that love of mata will appear. So we're a little bit wet. <laughs> so keep the hearing process going, never get discouraged. And then that hearing will build and build and build, and you'll get realizations after. Just like how many times did we ever hear the statement, you're not this body? How many times we hear that? So many times we read it, we hear it, we theoretically accept it, but do we realize it? And have we realized ourselves different from the body? But through the process of hearing, you can do that. You can come to that stage. I was, li I was listening to Srila Prabhupada giving a lecture, and he came to that statement, and he, he says, you know, we are different than this body. And I had heard that like, I don't know, so many times, and I can't count how many times I heard it. But when I heard it that one time, it, it clicked. Oh yeah, got it, I finally got it, yeah. Something happened. So that was due to continuous hearing. So when we continually hear, the process is working. Even though it may not seem to be, but it is, it's actually working. It's, it's purifying. Therefore, we should never give up the hearing process in any, in any situation and think that there is a better way to become Krishna conscious. Well, it's constantly hearing, continue, and of course, as the saying that says here in the purport, that through this hearing process, one gets the association of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And one who is not feeling that association, who is eager for that association, but not experiencing that association, it says they don't, they, they become, it says that association, which is remembrance of the Lord, by remembering of the Lord, we're associating with the Lord, it keeps the devotee alive. It keeps us alive. We have a tendency to remember something. Prabhupada said, why don't you just remember Krishna? You're always thinking about something. <laughs> Everything's going through the mind, right? <laughs> this, that, this, that. Most of it's useless. Most of it brings us down. This thing, remember Krishna. Well, the, the thing is, and Prabhupada said, before you can re really remember Krishna constantly, you have to be attracted to Krishna. Because if you're not attracted to someone, why would you remember them? <laughs> So that attraction comes from the hearing process because Krishna is all attractive and as we hear more about his pastimes, his activities, his relationships with his devotees and about his holy name, that attraction awakens because it's there. And the example is given like if you have an, a magnet, iron filings or anything I, uh, you know, ha has the quality of iron, is pulled in the direction of the magnet. But if there's rust on either the magnet or on the iron, it blocks that attracting potency. So what is that rust, you know? Kama, Kroda, Loba, Mohan, Madha, Matsarya. These are the lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, envy. These are the rusty coverings over, this, over the mind and the soul, which blocks that natural attraction. But the process works. Just keep on hearing. <laughs> hear, hear, and hear. And that will continue to work in such a way that you'll start getting realizations on the process of the knowledge that you're hearing. So Uddhava, he's really eager. He wants not only to hear, he wants to be qualified to hear. He's asking the Lord, am I qualified? He is qualified, but still, out of etiquette, out of respect for the Lord, he said, if you think I'm qualified. He's putting himself under the care of the Lord's decision. And then he also wants to understand that knowledge which is eternal, 
which doesn't change, which applies to all living entities, which brings them to the process of real self-realization. So that is, uh, we can learn from Uddhava. And Uddhava was a very intimate and personal associate of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is very dear to the Lord. In fact, <clears throat> Krishna sent Uddhava to Rindavan just to help him understand deeper. Uddhava thought he had a lot of love for Krishna, and he did. And he, but Krishna wanted to show him that your love is not as good as you think it is. <laughs> so he sent him to Rindavan to see and experience the love that the gopis had for Krishna. And when Uddhava saw and experienced that, he prays that in my next birth, just let me become a blade of grass in Vrindavan. So when the gopis are going this way and that way, the dust of their feet will touch upon my head. This is what he, he, he after experiencing how deep and how complete the love of the gopis was, he realized, I don't have any love. <laughs> but he, uh, he is a great devotee of the Lord. So Krishna wanted to give him some extra mercy, so he sent him to Vrindavan. And he also gave him a mission to tell the gopis about how, they, how much Krishna was thinking about him and how much he was, he was missing the gopis. But uh, somehow or other, Uddhava couldn't convince them that Krishna was thinking like that. <laughs> they thought, Krishna had abandoned them. Okay, so I'll stop here. I think. Any comments or questions? Yes. Hare Krishna. So I. So Uddhava is also eternal at the source, right? So. Why yeah. Why, why does he desire to become eternal, the, the no, grass in Vrindavan? No, no, he, in spiritual world, yeah. he can transform to blade of grass anyways, right? <laughs> so why does he want to be... That's his natural humility, just to glorify the, devo the, the gopis. Just to show the glory of the gopis' love, that there's nothing greater, that even I, who am an associate of Krishna, who want to get more of that knowledge because the gopis' love is on a higher level. It's more complete. It's the intensity of the love of the gopis that supersedes all forms of other love for Krishna. It's intense. It, it doesn't break for even a... Because, you know, the, they would say to Lord Brahma, Brahma, you're the creator. But you're, you're, not, you're a kind of a... You know, you don't know what you're doing. You can't create properly. You made eyes that have eyelids, and eyelids flash, and then we, we miss seeing Krishna for that time period. So you're blocking our vision by creating eyelids. And so it sounds like some kind of, you know, eulogy, but it's not. This is how they're feeling. They want to see Krishna all the time. They want to give their love to Krishna constantly. And there's nothing else in their existence except Krishna constantly. So Uddhava was able to experience that by the mercy of Krishna. And he understood, oh yes, my love is, <laughs> it's nowhere near the gopis. And you can never understand the love of the gopis, it's not possible. We read about it, we hear about it, and we can you know, try to understand it after we hear it, but we can never come close. It's intense. Thank you, uh, can I ask about yesterday's class which you were taking? I was contemplating on that, and then I about the uh, har the holy name. Yes, yes. The holy name. Uh, yesterday's class which you were taking. Yeah. You can categorize them in both, but there are two kinds of Shaktavesh. 
one who comes to the material world to do the work of the Lord and then becomes in, in, in fully empowered by the well is already fully empowered by the Lord before they come. And then there's those who develop that empowerment and become Shaktivesh. So it goes direct and indirect. But Prabhupada, from what we understand, was a direct. You know, he came to do this work. He was sent by the Lord. So, I mean, there's many statements to corroborate that. And Prabhupada was not simply a conditioned soul that, you know, somehow or other begot, performed a lot of bhakti and made it. But that doesn't minimize what he did. Not at all. He accepted hardships, yeah. And Krishna allowed those hardships to happen in order to show the glory of this soul. That those hardships are not something that's going to cause him to do something else or to give up his service. I mean, Prabhupada had to go on, you know, a boat, ocean liner for 38, 39 days and get seasick. I mean, Krishna, Krishna could have sent somebody to give him a TWA ticket from Bombay to New York. <laughs> Could have floated on the airplane. But that didn't happen. <laughs> so Krishna wanted to show the glories of this personality. But at the same time, he always protected Prabhupada. Although he put him, he allowed certain difficulties to come upon him, he still gave him full protection. And we should also remember that, that if we surrender to Krishna, we have full protection. We still might have to undergo some of the tribulations of the material energy. But you have to understand that one who is fully surrendered to the Lord doesn't suffer. It becomes difficult, but it's not suffering. Suffering comes from unfulfilled desires. Yeah, when you, when you try to fulfill your material desires and something else comes, that's called suffering. Or if you, under, you, ex, you experience the hardships of the material energy and you're still trying to enjoy that material energy, that's suffering. If you experience the hardships of the material energy and you're not trying to enjoy it, you're not really suffering. You're just undergoing some difficulties. That's all. Like now, we have this pandemic, or that's what they say. So it's, it's, the world is going through a lot of, people are not only suffering, but dying. But it's not for the devotees. It's provided we take shelter of Krishna and chant the holy names of the Lord and live properly. You know, we can't flaunt material energy and expect not to be victimized by it. Well, I'll just walk out in front of a car because I'm a devotee and therefore the car won't hit me because Krishna will, will make sure that car doesn't hit me. <laughs> That's foolish. <laughs> so you can't flaunt material energy, but when you take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then, yeah, he says that and the six symptoms of surrender, one of those is the Lord is the only protector, not just the protector, but the only one. He may use other means to give you protection, but he, it's be, he's the one that's doing it through his energy. That's Krishna. He always protects his devotee. So you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> as long as we take shelter. Okay, thank you. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Kavichandra Swami Maharaj ki jai, Samaveda Bhakta Vinda ki jai.